Welcome to this expert mini module on understanding types of student assessment data. In Project Expert, we are developing and testing a program to support teacher expertise in data-based instruction and improve outcomes for upper elementary students with persistent reading challenges. We have two guiding questions for this module. Throughout this module, we will think through content related to understanding types of student assessment data. What information do I gain from different types of student assessment data? And which type of student data should I use for instructional decision making? Many schools have a wealth of student data from various sources. This data can be used to support student achievement in many ways, such as examining school-wide data to consider whether and how to adapt curriculum, measuring progress towards grade level content standards, refining our delivery of instruction, and capturing students' current understandings and strengths in order to target identified needs. How can we align the multiple sources of data that we collect to our desired instructional goals? By engaging in an intentional and ongoing cycle of data use. This slide illustrates a data use cycle. Let's, let's explore what this cycle entails. Data collection is an iterative process and informs us where to take our instruction next. Data about student learning should be collected from multiple sources because no single assessment provides all the information teachers need to make desired instructional changes. Through the interpretation of student data, we can identify individual and whole class students' strengths and weaknesses to generate a hypothesis about how to improve student achievement. Once we have generated a hypothesis about how to improve student achievement, we can modify our instruction to test the hypothesis and better align our instruction to the student's current needs. Data collection is an iterative process, informing us where to take our instruction next. We utilize diver diverse sources of data at different spots in the cycle to improve our instruction. In the next slides, we will focus on sources to collect data from and how these types of data can inform your instruction. Again, data should be collected from multiple sources to provide a more comprehensive picture of which instructional changes should be made. The interpretation of data is necessary to identify strengths and hypothesize areas of improvement, and this allows us to modify our instruction to test your hypotheses and better align your instruction to student needs. Let's take a moment to reflect on your use of student data. If you need a bit more time, pause the video to think about these questions. How do you engage in this cycle of instructional improvement? What types of data do you collect? Where does your data come from? For example, state assessments. Now, let's explore some of the data sources most commonly used in schools. The next slides identify multiple types of data sources. In the United States, each state education agency is required to have a standardized assessment used to tap student performance annually. For example, in Texas, this is the STAR, or State of Texas Assessments of Academic Readiness. One data source is previous state assessments and other outcome assessment results. These data are summative assessments that provide a comprehensive assessment of curriculum across a time period. The purpose of state assessments is to gain a yearly comprehensive assessment of curricula across an entire year, capture achievement level of student groups in broad content areas, determine if students are meeting grade level benchmarks, and are used for accountability purposes related to educational equity and school or district level disparities in student performance. State assessments are helpful in that you can determine the effectiveness of a school-wide curriculum and instruction, or Tier 1 supports, and understand the inequities in instructional delivery and access. 
it is important to consider that significant time may have passed between the administration of a state assessment and the beginning of the next school year, and that students' knowledge and skills may have changed during that time. Just as with any data source, additional data should be collected for triangulation, and no single data source should be relied upon when generating hypotheses and modifying instructional practices. Let's continue to focus specifically on one type of progress monitoring measures, curriculum-based measurements, or CBMs. CBMs is an umbrella term that encompasses universal screening and progress monitoring. CBMs can be used to identify broad skills that students have mastered and which they have yet to master. They also allow us to note how students are progressing in the learning goals and standards. CBMs are helpful because they allow us to note even small changes in students' performance. CBMs are a broad name for brief measures that capture proficiency on key indicators, allow us to identify necessary changes to the curriculum or instructional delivery, and help us to determine if a student requires additional supports or interventions. CBMs are helpful in that they allow us to target interventions for struggling students and help us to evaluate whether a student is making progress. Another data source is universal screening. Universal screening assessments are typically given at the beginning of the school year and two to three times per year. They are used to evaluate the effectiveness of the school's core curriculum, environment, and instruction and to identify students who may not be making expected progress and may need additional diagnostic assessment and or intervention. Educators may use universal screening data for all students. This provides a brief snapshot of key skills two to three times a year and indicates whether students are generally on track or not. Universal screening is helpful in that it informs our initial instructional planning and grouping. It helps to evaluate universal tier one instruction, and we can make class or school-wide program decisions. Progress monitoring is another type of curriculum-based measure. Progress monitoring is a type of formative assessment that allows teachers to analyze the effectiveness of instruction and interventions. There are two types of progress monitoring, mastery measurement and general outcome measurement, often referred to as curriculum-based measurement, or CBM. Sometimes people use the terms progress monitoring and CBM interchangeably. Mastery measurement is helpful in understanding a student's level of performance on a single target skill. Educators may use progress monitoring data for measuring the effectiveness of intervention, to gain a brief snapshot of proficiency on key skills, which are typically repeated weekly or bi-weekly, and often CBMs are used to monitor progress. Progress monitoring is helpful in that it allows teachers to track student progress across the entire curriculum over time. It helps identify students not making adequate progress in a timely manner, and a lack of progress signals the need for instructional adjustments. The next data source we will be discussing are diagnostic assessments. Diagnostic assessments help us to identify specific skills and abilities to target through intervention for individual students experiencing difficulties or gaps in a specific skill set area. These assessments are used on an as needed basis, primarily with at risk students. Educators may use diagnostic assessment data to develop a hypothesis for potential causes of academic difficulties or assess specific skills. Diagnostic assessments enable us to create individualized intensive interventions for struggling students, understand their specific strengths and needs, and helps us to align our instruction with their needs. A fidelity of implementation of data checklist is another source of data we can use. 
We often use specific plans or programs to deliver high quality evidence-based instruction to the students who need it most. However, if a student isn't responding to our instruction, we need to be sure that they're receiving the instruction in the way that we believe they are receiving it. If fidelity to the program implementation is low, we must improve our ability to deliver the program through a fidelity of implementation data check. Using a fidelity of implementation of data check, we can track the extent to which the instructional program is implemented as it was intended, and understand the relationship between the intervention and student outcomes. This enables us to understand if the student is receiving the instruction that we assume they are getting and enables us to reflect on our own implementation of our instructional practices, for example, the quality and quantity. The final data source we will go over is behavior and motivation data. By using behavior and motivation data, we can identify potential behavioral or motivation problems that may be impacting or impeding a student's learning. With this information, we can determine what other factors may be impacting a student's progress or response to our instruction. This helps us to rule out alternative behavioral explanations if a student is not responding to instruction, and we can monitor progress to identify more intensive supports needed. It is important to collect and analyze behavior and motivation data in order to identify potential behavioral or motivation problems that may be impacting or impeding a student's learning. All types of data can provide useful information, but one data source cannot provide us with all the information we need to inform our next steps. Each type of data was created with a specific purpose in mind. Thus, we need to understand that each data source may inform our decision making differently. Now that you know more about multiple sources of data, think about the main takeaway from each of the data types. State assessments can inform our use of whole group assessment of skills and instruction. Curriculum based measurement or CBM can inform our evaluation if an individual student is making progress or requires additional supports. Universal screening helps us to identify students not making progress. Progress monitoring informs our targeted instruction for at-risk students. Diagnostic assessments inform the intensive and individualized instruction for struggling students. A fidelity of implementation helps us to determine if the intervention is implemented as it was designed and behavior and motivation data can help us to individualize behavior and motivation supports to better facilitate learning. As noted on this slide, some data sources are more aligned to the development of Tier 1 interventions for all students, while others are used for individualization with at-risk or struggling students as Tier 2 or Tier 3 interventions. In order to individualize and adapt instruction for students, it is important to know who your target student population is and that your data source aligns with the data decision you would like to make for a particular student or students. This alignment can better inform the instructional adjustments and modifications that you need to make. Let's take a moment to reflect on student data. If you need a bit more time, pause the video to think about this question. Marco is having difficulty with oral reading fluency. His teacher has completed progress monitoring and Marco is still not showing expected progress. What type of data should the teacher collect next? The teacher should complete a diagnostic assessment to determine where he is still struggling and then create more individualized instruction accordingly. After universal screening, was conducted with Sarah and her class, Sarah continued to display difficulty with decoding skills. The teacher implemented a more targeted reading intervention. What type of measurement should the teacher use to determine if the intervention is working? Progress monitoring.
Jose has been receiving explicit small group instruction for reading comprehension and has exhibited non-responses on CVMs. What other data is helpful to gain here? Behavior and motivation data. Let's now review our guiding questions. What information do I gain from different types of student assessment data? I gain information on the strengths and weaknesses of individual students, what changes are necessary to make to the curriculum or instructional delivery, and I can determine if a student requires additional supports or interventions. Which types of student data should I use for instructional decision making? State assessments, CBMs, diagnostic assessments, fidelity of implementation checklists, and behavior and motivation data. Thank you for your time and engagement during this mini training module. Check out our Project Expert YouTube channel for other mini modules and for resources to support database decision making in reading. Don't forget to like and subscribe. For questions about Project Expert, please contact the Principal Investigator, Dr. Jessica Tost at the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Tost's email is jrto ste at austin.utexas.edu. Project Expert is supported by a grant from the Institute of Education Sciences, U.S. Department of Education. Thank you.